Good afternoon. I'm Ernie Bauer, uh, President and CEO of Bauer Group Asia. When our partners at the U.S. India Business Council invited me to moderate a panel at today's Ideas Summit, I asked for this one, uh, the, the panel on India's energy transition. Arguably, no sector will be more impactful in the context of the dynamic India-U.S. relationship than energy. And within the energy sector, the energy transition is where we're likely to see the most transformative impact. As our omnipresent host, Atul, said yesterday in his CNBC piece, in the context of the energy transition in India, U.S. investors are ready to invest as much as $100 billion in India immediately. And if they do, trade volumes will swell. India has surpassed China as the world's most populous country, adding to its accolades as the world's largest democracy and one of its most dynamic economies. Demographics are destiny. And India, despite its impressive growth trajectory and progress towards universal energy access, consumes energy only at 1 14th the rate as we do here in the United States. India's next phase of economic development, as it strives to become a $5 trillion economy by the end of the decade, will necessitate accelerated modernization of its energy infrastructure and significant growth in its energy con uh, consumption. Demand must quadruple to meet that target. Given the intertwining of electricity supplies and the commitment to transition from gray to green, its contribution for the energy mix will be shared by the contours, shaped by the contours of its transition to clean energy. Were the infrastructure dilemma not challenging enough, India's energy sector modernization must integrate its ambitious climate pledges, including sourcing 50% of its electricity supply from carbon-free sources by 2030, that's in seven years, and a net zero economy by 2070, well accounting for its evolving energy vulnerabilities. Fortunately, today, we have a great panel to help us understand the right balance of that, as today's theme aptly captures, fosters trust, strengthens reliance, and promotes growth. To get us started, I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Eno Ebong, the director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, one of the U.S. government's most high impact and best when it comes to dollar for dollar returns. Dr. Ebong was nominated by President Biden to serve as USTDA's director. She was confirmed by unanimous consent of the U.S. Senate. As director, Dr. Ebong leads a USTA, uh, USTDA uh, team in its efforts to develop sustainable, clean infrastructure and foster economic growth in emerging economies while also supporting job, U.S. jobs through, the, through, the, through U.S. exports and services. Dr. Ebong assumed the helm at TDA after starting her public service at the agency and rising through the ranks in several roles as career civil servant, including those as general counsel, deputy director, and chief operating officer. As deputy director, she led the development and execution of TDA's international program and oversaw all agency operations. Please join me in welcoming this incredibly dynamic leader to open our discussion today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure and delight to be here uh, to see all of you. Um, I want to thank, first and foremost, the U.S. Chamber for hosting us here, and of course, to the U.S. India Business Council um, for your always gracious, 
and constructive way of gathering us all together to talk about issues of import and to build on our relationships and partnerships. It really is a pleasure to be here and, and I'm grateful for the invitation to participate in the US, rather the India Ideas Summit, an annual general meeting. This was an invitation that I could not resist. The subject of leading the energy transition is a daily conversation at the US Trade and Development Agency. And it's actually the reason that I visited India um, earlier this year. The focus of today's discussion is on innovative pathways to energy security. You know, as we speak about specific technologies that advance this goal, I do think it's important to frame our discussion in the context of partnerships. Uh, and I think this has been a, a theme uh, today. I think it's important in this context because the innovative pathways uh, that we take, I think will only be successful through innovative partnerships. And this is where USTDA is proud to play a role. If you indulge me for just a few minutes, I, I, I would like to put that in a bit of context. So USTDA has a unique dual mission that includes developing sustainable infrastructure in emerging economies while generating US export opportunities to the projects that we support. Specifically, USTDA provides grant funding for project preparation assistance, including feasibility studies, technical assistance, and pilot projects. And there are good reasons why we do so. These are the critical tools that define the technical requirements for infrastructure priorities. They help attract the investment that is needed to implement sustainable infrastructure projects and create export opportunities for US businesses. At bottom, we are about economic growth in both our countries. We think that the foundation uh, for that is high quality infrastructure, which will support jobs in India and jobs in the United States. Our guiding principles, if you will, are mutual benefit and our common prosperity. USTDA also funds partnership building activities between India and the United States with the goals of sharing knowledge, exchanging information, and working with our partners so that they can find solutions for their infrastructure projects. For 30 years, USTDA has been a resource to India's private sector, state governments, and the federal government. We have funded over 200 infrastructure development activities during this period and have become a reliable partner because our program brings the best of what the US private sector has to offer. The flexibility of our mission and our tools and our experience makes us a natural partner then to advance the energy transition in countries such as India. I shared my view earlier that innovative pathways to energy security require innovative partnerships. Here are just a few examples. Uh, in August of 2021, USTDA and the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum launched the US Climate Technologies Action Group, or CTAG. This is a public-private partnership to accelerate US collaboration in India's clean energy sector and mobilize capital for climate smart infrastructure projects. Earlier this year, when I traveled to India, I had the honor of launching the Interstate Clean Energy Procurement Program, or ICEP. ICEP is a partnership between USTDA and eight Indian states to develop clean energy infrastructure through public procurement practices that focus on high quality and value for money instead of lowest cost. Our eight state partners of Gujarat, Haryana, Karnataka, Kerala, Maharashtra, Punjab, Tamil Nadu, and West Bengal have a combined population of over 500 million people. They have ambitious renewable energy targets requiring billions of dollars in new investment. 
These states are among India's leaders in terms of installed renewed energy, renewable energy capacity, and we are working with them to help unlock that new investment capital. ICEP is another example of how USTDA builds pathways to deploy the kind of innovative technologies that will strengthen India's energy security. Across India, USTDA is funding project preparation activities with Indian project sponsors, public and private, and with US industry that are advancing the country's clean energy transition. These partnerships, for example, are evaluating clean and resilient baseload power technology for the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, hybrid renewable energy and battery storage technology in Gujarat, and smart grids in Delhi. So this is just a short introduction to an energy program in India that is based on 30 years of history and partnership. It is a great source of pride for us that India's public and private sectors have regarded USTDA as a valuable and trusted partner for the energy sector development and transition. Working with the US India Business Council, I believe that we have an opportunity to deepen our engagement still. USTDA has worked closely with the organizations that my fellow panelists represent, so I look forward to hearing their perspectives on innovative technology development. I will also be listening for opportunities for USTDA to support new partnerships and pathways to India's energy security. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ibong. Thanks for those great remarks. Now let me introduce our panel. Um, on Dr. Ebong's right is Ambassador Jeff Pyatt. He's Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Energy Resources at the U.S. Department of State, a position he has served in since September 2022. In his storied career, Ambassador Pyatt has extensive personal and professional experience in India, having served three times in the U.S. Embassy in Delhi, the last one as Deputy Chief of Mission. Next, uh, Craig Husa is the Director of Energy at Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin Energy approaches climate change as fundamentally an engineering challenge and is leveraging its technology, innovation, and research and development capabilities to meet that challenge. And finally, from India, Mr. Pankaj, Pankaj uh, Sindwani is the Chief Business Officer for Tata Clean Tech Capital. Tata Clean Tech Capital is the first green bank in India. I asked him as we got ready to come out uh, for the panel how long uh, the bank has existed. Ten years is the answer. So if you want to if you want to know where vision is in Delhi, uh, it's right here uh, with Pankaj. He functions as a joint, the, the bank fun functions as a joint venture between Tata Capital and the International Finance Corporation. So I can't think of a more talented panel uh, to talk about how India and the US can identify and execute innovative pathways to energy security amidst their transition to a net zero future. We get started, I'll start with you, Ambassador Pyatt. We have a big visit coming up next week. Uh, Prime Minister Modi coming for a state visit. Uh, could you tell us uh, what, what do you have planned? What does the Biden administration have planned on the energy portfolio for that visit? Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Ernie, and thank you so much to USIBC for, for having me as part of this discussion. It's an incredibly exciting time in the U.S.-India energy, energy transition, energy security relationship, so I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about it. Uh, the first thing I, I would emphasize is just the, the consequential nature of the U.S.-India partnership on these issues. Um, there will be no more important country in the world in terms of driving global energy demand over the next few decades between now and 2050 than India. And there is a, such extraordinary potential uh, for us to deepen our partnership on all of the issues around energy transition. The United States is very supportive of Prime Minister Modi's ambitious goals for renewable energy generation, and I was making the point to Pankaj and others as we were in the green room 
that I think this visit, visit is a great opportunity for New Delhi to articulate its own energy vision and, and how convergent that is with the United States. Uh, I think it's extremely important that this happens um, a year after the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in, in the U.S. Congress, which is really, as you all know, changing the conversation about energy transition here in the United States in all the critical areas that are going to drive our clean energy future in terms of green hydrogen, in terms of carbon sequestration, in terms of expansion of electric vehicles. These are all exactly the same areas where Prime Minister Modi and his government are emphasizing. Um, and then the point I would also make, and it's great to be up here on stage with Eno as well, because as I look back on my, um, my decades of involvement with the US and India relationship, the thing that's really changed most significantly is the rise of global Indian companies, companies like Tata and Reliance, and the opportunities that that creates for deepening partnership with our leading companies that are also working in this area. I think as we look to the future, I want to make sure that the United States is India's preferred partner on all of these issues of energy transition, whether we're talking about the growth of our, our green hydrogen industries and, and the way in which American companies are leveraging the Inflation Reduction Act and companies in India are leveraging the incentives that Prime Minister Modi has created through the PLI program, the Production Link Incentives, how we diversify supply chains, de-risking our exposure to China, which is the overwhelming dominant provider of critical minerals, silicon wafers, solar cells, uh, um, wind power, nacelles, all of the things that will drive the clean energy economy. So we have a fantastic opportunity, and I, I think the biggest challenge that I face in working on these issues is just making sure that our level of ambition in the government meets the moment in terms of what our private sectors are talking about. Great segue. Craig, uh, let's, talk to, uh, let's hear from the U.S. private sector. India has a target of achieving 50% uh, cumulative electric power installed capacity from non-fossil fuel based energy resources in just seven years. To achieve that, energy storage will have to become a, a very, have to become a, a central uh, part of that effort in grid integration, services, and balancing. So how does Lockheed Energy think about this? How, is it, how does its solutions arm view the opportunity and what steps does India need to take to unlock that stationary storage development. Thanks, Ernie. It's great to be uh, part of this discussion. Um, energy transition is is a massive undertaking that touches everything, and just a, it, you know, and using kind of energy storage as as just one example of that, and and sharing a little more context on that. So, in 2022, there was 240 megawatt hours of energy storage in India, and in 2030, it's projected to be 27,000 megawatt hours of energy storage. That's over a 1,000x growth. That doesn't just happen easily or, or, uh, uh, or by itself. Uh, two weeks ago, my wife and I were in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we saw a t-shirt in the window and it said, parenting, it takes a village and a vineyard. And I think parenting a new industry such as this is the same. The, 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 it takes a village, and then that vineyard can help kind of uh, calm the nerves because this is a challenge. And, and, and when you look at, at something such as, again, as, as energy storage, like, well, we just put out big batteries. And uh, well, what, the, the solution has to match the problem. And so with energy storage, there's a variety of use cases with that. And, and so ultimately, different solutions may be necessary for different, different applications. One that we know, is it's when you've got a lot of renewables on intermittent, you need to be able to time shift those. And it's not just peak shaving, it's, it's diurnal shifting, it can be seasonal shifting. Uh, you also have with transmission and distribution, enhanced reliability by putting a battery at the end of distressed power lines and, and that sort of thing. You also, for microgrids, for resiliency and, and energy security, which of course, not just for a microgrid, but it can be for a whole country. These things all matter and they all play together. Uh, as as a, in the private sector, some of these uh, particular use cases have very clear revenue streams. Others are not necessarily, you know, energy security, depending on, on uh, who's being secured through it, uh, may or may not have a clear, clear uh, 
uh, re revenue stream. So that's where it takes private industry to be able to create the solutions that match the problems. That's what we are. That's what we're doing, and and others are as well. But it also takes that getting back to that that village. It takes the the combination with government financiers to be able to help share that risk and share the, the expertise and resources to, to build that ecosystem because it does. It really, when we're talking energy transition, it touches everything. And, uh, and it's a worthy goal, but it's, it's, it, it takes some effort. Let me turn now to, uh, to Pankaj in the, from, a, from a banker's perspective. Uh, what can be done to encourage more private investments to accelerate India's energy transition and achieve its net zero ambitions? And can you think about and share your thoughts about multilateral agencies and development finance institutions? What role would they play in, in your effort to do that? Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, USIBC. Thank you, Ambassador Keshap, for putting together such a wonderful event. Um, to your question, uh, let's just look at some numbers. So if you're looking at net zero ambitions of India, uh, uh, and India is pledged to be net zero by 2070, the uh, rough estimates are that India will require $10 trillion. Yeah? Uh, now contrast this with the asset under management of the entire banking sector in India. It is $2.7 trillion today. Right? From $2.7 trillion of the entire banking exposure, we are looking to invest $10 trillion in next uh, you know, four or five decades. That's one. If you look at um, the uh, solar capacity that would help India become net zero by 2070, the total capacity will be in the vicinity of 5,600 gigawatts. Today, that capacity is 65 gigawatts. So we are likely to grow 100 times. If you look at uh, more immediate targets, say 2030, we are, uh, as Prime Minister Modi has uh, already announced, we'll be, uh, we'll be having a capacity of 500 gigawatt non-fossil fuel, 500 gigawatt capacity by 2030. Now, that alone will require roughly $1 trillion worth of investment. India's entire mortgages market today is uh, about uh, 300 billion. So three times that investment. So numbers are staggering. Yeah? And uh, when we look at that kind of a scale, the sources of capital will need to be found both domestically and internationally. You would imagine that a country like India, which is growing and which has a lot of other needs also, will always have limited constrained fiscal space to be able to accommodate you know, such huge growth. Uh, and, and almost this quantum of money only being dedicated towards climate. So international cooperation is a must here. And for that, we'll need to uh, intermediate, channelize a lot of uh, climate money into India. Now, is money really a problem? If you look at the overall uh, uh, you know, size of pension, insurance, and sovereign wealth funds, it's close to, if my, if my estimates are right, $100 trillion. Now, if you compare then this with what India requires, it's a pittance. It's hardly any amount. So why is, why is that money not flowing in into, into India? And uh, the, the reason is the perceived risk. Perceived risk around, uh, around the country risk or currency risk or the performance risk. But the reality is far different. We started our business 10 years back. We have funded more than 350 projects. And you would be amazed to know only one account is non-performing asset. Our return on asset is best in the industry, right? Almost 3% return on, return on the asset. India has funded roughly 50 gigawatt worth of projects, right? Uh, close to $25 billion worth of projects. Not one is an NPA, right? What does it tell you? That the perceived, there, there needs to be a greater amount of awareness around, uh, you know, what is the real risk investing in India? And therefore, can you really reduce the premium that you have on uh, the risk that you assign to a particular country, to a particular technology? And how do you bring that down? And please, un and I was speaking to um, a private equity investor, and I was asking him, you know, what kind of, you know, uh, the IRR threshold these days you have for investments in India. And I was shocked when I was told the uh, thresholds are in the vicinity of 20%, 25% dollar. 
Now you can imagine if, if the expectations are 20 or 25 percent dollar, in INR terms it translates to almost 30 percent. Now please understand, someone is paying for it. You know, a poor, uh, uh, you know, a poor person in, in the state of Jharkhand or Bihar who does not have an access to electricity, he's paying for that uh, uh, higher demand for the returns that the world is ex expecting. I think one, we need to normalize that expectation in terms of what you really want from the market. Plus, you also need to uh, somehow understand the risks better. Basis, there is so much of now data available. India is a market which is almost 10, 15 years old in terms of solar capacity. The policy, re policy regime is quite stable. The environment is quite conducive. So why do you need to charge all those premiums uh, that you particularly assign to uh, a country like India? And if that happens, see, I can tell you we do not need so much of money in grants. Of course, grant money is needed for loss and damage, for adaptation, for much of mitigation, specifically for traditional sectors, we may not need uh, so much money in grant. This money needs to come to India at reasonable uh, return expectation. The, uh, the second part is where the MDBs can play a very vital role, the new sectors that Ambassador Payet also referred to, whether it is green hydrogen, electric mobility. See, these are nascent sectors. And today on their own, they are not commercially viable. And unlike developed world, we do not have the fiscal space to offer, offer tax credits or large budget outlays, you know, so that you can continue to absorb losses for a period of time. So you need to have some other blended finance mechanism there. The MDBs can play a very, very important role where they can bring in some part of the money and that money can be used to bear the first loss or, for instance, to enhance the, the credit rating of a particular project or particular entity. And thereafter, it becomes way much attractive for the private sector to come in with, with their kind of money. There is an example uh, of this. We've, we have, uh, bought, we have uh, secured line from Green Climate Fund. And we've used, it, used that blended finance facility to, to build almost $250 million portfolio of a solar rooftop alone. So something similar can be done in many other sectors. The MDBs will need to rethink their role. Uh, uh, a major uh, part of what they are doing today is basically crowding out private investments. Their job is to crowd in private investments. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I wonder from your TDA, uh, position. Uh, you're hearing some eye-watering numbers here. Obviously, a massive op uh, opportunity. And I just want to—I wanted to ask you: How does how do you think of TDA fits into this mix in the energy transition, uh, innovation in India, and and what role and and how will you play that role? Thank you so much for that. And I I want to actually start by piggybacking a bit on what Craig mentioned about the need of an ecosystem and that everyone has their role, government, private sector, innovators, creators, um, and also, uh, Craig referenced, delimiting risk. And so this is where an agency like USTDA, I think, has great impact. Um, because we come in at that early stage where there's a concept um, but it needs to be proven to be able to attract the financing. Uh, and so this engages a couple of things. One, understanding the landscape, connecting with partners, listening to industry, and developing projects uh, that have a likelihood of financing. And so I would say that the role for USTDA is a, a little bit of uh, project sleuth. Uh, it's a little bit of um, knitting together of various parties um, and it's identifying the um, priorities uh, of the partners on the ground. And it's probably, I think, to highlight the innovative space, helpful to give a couple of examples. Um, so one of the projects I, I like to describe is, is a project that was brought to us by a, a women-led uh, company called Lanzatech. The company's actually gone public uh, since their first engagement with us that came to us together with the Indian Oil Corporation. Lanzatech is a company that uh, manufactures a carbon capture technology that produces uh, a cleaner uh, ways of, um, well, actually helps industrial clients 
produce cleaner fuels and reduce emissions. And so the Indian Oil Corporation was interested in being able to convert oil refinery waste gases um, into fuel grade ethanol. Lanzatech had this technology, they had the idea, they had the partner in Indian oil that had interest, but there needed to be a way to prove the feasibility, and that's where USTDA came in, and uh, by grant funding uh, provided that uh, feasibility study that proved proved the concept for the location. Um, and then, you know, I, I always say we may have facilitated Lanza Tech's entry into the market, but it's all about their analysis and their technology that caused Indian oil to be interested and to invest. Um, and now the partners are building a pilot uh, facility outside of Delhi. It's going to help assuming that it's all proven out, reduce emissions in, in northern India. And I think the role of USTDA was apt. Um, it was early, it was helping to delimit the risk, it was helping the parties um, get what they needed uh, to be able to move the project along. I think obviously the needs are high um, and there's value to uh, the project um, uh, approach. I will say this all does need to be scaled. It's very important that um, we build um, on all these needs and make sure that projects come to fruition. Um, and it's the responsibility of us in government um, to, to be able to catalyze uh, that, that investment and showcase uh, what industry can bring to the solutions. Thank you very much. So, Jeff, we're hearing the challenges are access to technology, the financing and bankability of projects. You're sort of in the middle of tying everything together. Um, what in particular could the growing volume of multilateral relationships um, in, in the energy or touching on the energy areas such as the Quad, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, the International Energy Agency, the International Solar Alliance, there are more. You know, how are your discussions in these foras relevant to the discussion that we're having here to get the technology and the financing together as U.S. and India to meet the needs of this transition in both our countries? Uh, thank you for raising the issue. Ernie, and it goes to something, I mean, when Atul and I were working in the early days of the U.S.-India nuclear deal, what we always talked about was how important the partnership between our two governments was going to be, not just in terms of the bilateral relationship, but how our two democracies are seen to be working together on the global stage. And I still think for all of the headaches and difficulties it faced, the most important single aspect of the, the nuclear deal was that the, was the fact that it was the first big thing that our two governments were ever seen to be doing together. Today, we've got a lot more of that going on. Uh, one great example in the renewable space is the International Solar Alliance, which the United States is supporting, but it's an Indian-led initiative, bringing scalable solar technology to Africa and other developing countries. Another great example where I hope we will see progress in the weeks ahead is an effort that my bureau leads at the State Department, the Mineral Security Partnership, which is aimed at building high ESGs and coalitions of countries that are interested in creating what Secretary Blinken likes to call a better offer for especially developing countries that have the, the critical battery minerals that are gonna be so important to our energy transition. Um, so there's lots of scope, I think, for the U.S. and India to work together on that. You mentioned also the, the IEA, the International Energy uh, Agency. And again, this is an area where the U.S. is supporting India's aspiration to play a more significant role in the IEA, reflecting the fact, as I said earlier, that if you look at the IEA numbers, there is no more important country in the world in terms of what global energy markets are going to look like over the next three decades than India. So I think that just goes to the point that at a strategic level in terms of what we seek, there is a very high degree of convergence between the United States and India. 
We have exactly the same strategic interests in terms of building an energy system that is more sustainable, that um, meets the requirements of the climate crisis, and, and recognizing that India has more people vulnerable to the effects of climate change than any other country in the world. Um, and the understanding that how we work together, whether it's on green hydrogen or small modular reactors or diversifying solar supply chains, is going to make a critical contribution, not just to the pace of energy transition here in the United States or in India, but also how we deploy globally. And I, I you know, just to finish on this point, one of the things that comes with living in Delhi for, for seven years is you realize that the Indian system produces solutions that look very, very different from what somebody sitting in Washington or Chicago or Los Angeles or Seattle would come up with. But oftentimes that's a solution that's much more suitable to a developing country environment. So this is a very powerful force multiplier, which is about building opportunity and sustainability, not just in our two countries, but really um, across the global picture. Themes developing here, trust, resilience, and when you talk about resilience, Craig, maybe I could, maybe I could come to you and, and ask you to talk a little bit about supply chain resilience. Um, given the concentration uh, at various stages of the lithium ion battery supply chain and concerns about adequate raw materials, um, Jeff just touched a little bit on these. How will battery technology innovation help improve supply chain resiliency, and where does that fit into the ecosystem we're discussing? Great, and it's really a, an important, obviously, question uh, that starts at the very start of the inception of the technology. Uh, in the lab, you can have uh, a variety of different components to that technology. You can have table scraps. We have, uh, you know, a lot of interesting things going around waste to, to energy. But that, but you have to continue and look at the whole value stream of and, and use cases I mentioned before, you know, the environmental uh, locations that these will be operating in and, and, and the scale. And so with lithium ion batteries, they've been established, they're, they're good, people know them. But there is an issue with availability of, of, of uh, some of the elemental components of them and just a challenge. They're, they're in certain locations that are not always easily accessible, not accessible in, in uh, some proper ways sometimes. There's uh, other issues around uh, just performance around a little thing about catching fire. Uh, and so you look at at alternatives, and there's a lot of a lot of work being done on alternatives. And so, with at, at Lockheed, we had a bunch of big brains in the back room thinking about, okay, what if we were going to invent, the, you know, something that would not have supply chain issues? Okay, so ours is based off of earth abundant metals. It's commonly construction material, uh, in in food uh, additives, commodity chemicals. So you start there, and and then as you're building that as the base level of the product, then you have to look at how that's going to be, be operated because it's not just those, those kind of, in our case, the precursor chemicals that go into the chemistry of the battery, but then you look at, okay, there's kind of three components of it. It's, it's some of those proprietary components, some of the kind of other special components, and then the balance of plant. So the balance of plant can, you know, when you're looking at supply chain, uh, you know, and we look globally, and so when we're looking at, at India and being able to set up supply chains, which we're, which we're doing and looking to do even further, some of the balance and plant things are kind of the easy part. Some of the, the next, next level is the, you know, because it's pumps, it's pipes, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 uh, it's tanks. Uh, then you start looking at some of the special equipment that you are optimized off of, inverters and some of the control uh, equipment, and those can be you know, those can be found too. You may need to work with some of those supply suppliers to be able to optimize it for your solution. And then you go to the proprietary things. And so, you know, our electrolyte is our special sauce, is one of our special sauces. We actually already are working with a manufacturer in India. But as we're looking to scale that, it goes back to how do you, uh, you know, this is a new, new product and most suppliers don't want to just scale on a vision, they want to be able to see a contract. And so that's where we mitigate the risk with partners, around financial partners, 
and uh, and around the uh, you know government regulations to be able to help support that. So so really, supply chain is a very complex beast that can be optimized in a variety of ways starting early on, and uh, and I think it takes it takes that village to do that as well. Speaking of villages, India has taken the lead on on the issue of climate finance in international forums and as president of the G20 this year, Pankaj, India is intent on elevating commitments and contributions of the global north to uh, address climate change, climate mitigation and adaptation for the global south. But how do you see, how would you define success in that discussion, in that forum? I think it's really important for all of us to understand how you're thinking about it, how India is thinking about that. Sure. Um, so again, let's look at some numbers. 85% of the world population uh, lives in global south. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, most countries in the global south are either in tropics or close to uh, tropic. The third, 63 to 65% of uh, emission is originating from uh, these global south countries. But how much of money is really flowing to global south? It's a fraction of the overall investment which is getting made to uh, climate projects. So one, the trillions need to flow to billions. I think that's something which is paramount. And that needs to happen at the right cost, the point that I was making earlier also. Because see, the cost of capital is almost 70 or 80% of the cost of energy. So if the cost of capital is very high, it means 700 billion plus people who are in the global south and who do not have access to affordable uh, energy, they get penalized, right? So let's not keep the cost of capital, one access to capital and then the right cost of capital. That is uh, paramount. That is something that India uh, would want. The second is in your energy security. And I think that is something which was partly addressed by both Mr. Payet and uh, Craig. Uh, See, one country is today uh, supplying almost 86% of the solar panels. Uh, something is true for, uh, you know, the other parts of the, um, uh, the clean technology uh, continuum. So how do we make sure that we, we become self-reliant or we have collaboration with like-minded countries so that there is not over-dependence on, uh, you know, a particular geography for, for your supply chains. And for that, it is extremely important that we move away from the mindset of technology transfer to co-creating, co-owning the IPRs. I think that is very important. Uh, so we pool in resources, whether they are financial resources or human resources, to co-create and co-own these technologies. I think that is uh, second. And third is... How do we build resilience uh, in countries which are already vulnerable, right? Where the climate change has already uh, Im started impacting. So how do we start building resilience for that? And the fourth, and I think India has again taken a lead for that, is how do we influence the individual action through programs like uh, a Lifestyle for Environment? How do you influence the individual action? And believe me, if billions of people uh, alter their uh, action. It can actually alter the demand uh, dynamics, and it can Im impact, uh, or it can actually originate so many new opportunities for circular economy uh, startups. So I think these would be the four or five core ideas coming out of India's G20 presidency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, probably have time for one more question. Um, when we talked earlier, you said the sweet spot for TDA is when there's market demand and the market demand in areas that fit with the geopol geopolitical priorities of, of the United States. So how do you think about India in that context, particularly on the policy side, perhaps? Well, I, I see India as a very active, forward-looking partner. Um, I saw this in, at, at, at several levels, um, in the private sector, at the federal government stage, in the states. And I saw this in January when I was there. Um, every uh, sort of uh, approach to uh, fighting the climate challenge um, was a topic of conversation at all of these different um, levels of participation. And so I, I think that you cannot have a more uh, knowledgeable, technologically 
um, based, um, the human resources are there um, in terms of the partner that you would want to uh, work with. So to me, uh, front and center, I think Ambassador said it well, um, you know, all the elements are there and uh, I think we um, have a lot to build on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wanna thank this panel uh, for a tremendous discussion. That's a lot to fit into 35 minutes. I hope, uh, I hope it was useful to you. I hope you got some, uh, some ideas of the scale uh, of what the energy transition will mean to our economy and to India's. It is mind boggling what the opportunity is. And each of these individuals are playing a, a key role from policy to innovation to financing um, and, I, and I really would like to ask you to join me in thanking them for their contributions. I also want to thank uh, Atul and the, and the U.S. India Business Council for an outstanding event to have the, to have the ambition to put something this, this wide-ranging and, and complex together and do it with what looks like um, ease and, and, and just it's running very smoothly. Congratulations to you. I also want to say thank you to Sid who <laughs> I don't know how many hours he put into this, uh, this panel. Thank you, Sid. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know you probably managed 10 other, other parts of this event as well. I don't know how you do it. I, I, I want to sum up with, with three points here and, and go back to the theme of the conference. I don't think we make it. Uh, we don't make these goals uh, that, that you've outlined in energy transition without trust, resilience, and obviously growth. On, on trust, India's global partnerships and its partnership with the United States, I think will undergird any successful path forward. And that's gonna take a lot of trust between, the, between India and the United States. The India Business Council <laughs> has dedicated itself to this mission. I think, Jeff, the work that you've done in this area is amazing. And so you and your colleagues on the Indian side, um, uh, Ambassador Sandhu, it's an amazing piece of work. And, and we really thank you for that. Resilience is sort of embedded in everything that you all, th all four of you have talked about. Um, and growth, it's inevitable, it seems, in this area. And how we do it, and if we do it well, uh, the benefits to not only to, to all of us, but our children and grandchildren will be consequential. So thank you again for listening to us today. Uh, we're, we really enjoyed it, and thank you for inviting us. Thank you.